Friends Podcast. Hi, I'm Diane Hunt. I am an impressionist realist painter connecting with nature through my brush. I work in oil paint and watercolor and I live in the countryside of Maryland's eastern shore, not far from the Chesapeake Bay. You can find me online at dianehuntstudio.com and on Facebook and Instagram at Diane Hunt Studio. Hi, I'm Constance Brosson of Steve Brosson's Jewelry Designs. I live in Oklahoma on a prairie, and I make uh, handmade jewelry in silver, copper, and brass. I'm an artist that paints. I paint pastels and in oil sometimes. Hello, this is Bob JKL. I'm the host of this podcast. I am a emerging representational artist. I do historic rend- renderings, seascapes, landscapes, volcanicals, birds, and whatnot. The tight illustrative hand and watercolor, pen and ink, and acrylic paints. And I live in Oklahoma City. And here we are for Monday, January the 18th. My name is Clyde J. Kale, and you are listening to the Artist Friends Podcast, Episode 80. And once again, I'm here with my two best artist friends, Diane Hunt and Constance Bronson. Hello, Diane. Hi, Clyde. Hello, Constance. Hello, everybody. Hello, Constance. Hi, Clyde. Hi, Diane. Hello, everybody. You know, I'm I'm going to start saying... Say hi to everybody, Constance. Let's see if she falls in into the Gracie Gracie Allen, you know, comedy routine. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about that once before off air. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you two for joining me. And this week's theme is uh, art history or art biography or something like that. So I decided a, a type of artist that uh, a lot of the uh, – fine art folks, the uh, so-called sophisticated uh, art community folks, they snub their nose up at them. And these are the comic book artists. They are true artists in their right, in their own. And so I found a couple of videos. Um, one video is by uh, the uh, talking about the, the story and the biography of Jack Kirby who was very much, uh, pretty much uh, uh, his attribution is he created Marvel Comics, you know, and, and uh, with his illustrations and, and everything. But what I also found was a video, I had not seen this one before, about the life of Roy Lichtenstein. And Roy Lichtenstein, uh, this was in 1991, before he passed away. We had talked about Roy Lichtenstein before. But it was a video that was done after he had uh, passed away and they had interviews with his wife. And uh, this was with uh, Roy was still alive. And he pretty much uh, from the artist's mouth uh, explained his uh, creative process and how he came about. With he kind of, uh, uh, you know, he was in part of the pop art movement with uh, Andy Warhol and the others. But he left those guys instead of uh, doing industrial images and and Campbell soup cans and whatnot. He was fascinated with comic books because he grew up on them and uh, taking the comic books images and enlarging them and uh, expressing uh, their, uh, his, uh, his, his artistic uh, philosophy. And he was heavily, very much influenced by Jack Kirby. So that's why I uh, 
uh, I made that connection right away. And uh, uh, Diane, got any comment commentary about these uh, videos, sir? Well, it was interesting listening to Roy about how he um, picked his um, subjects out of the comic books that he had. I mean, he would go through and look at each uh, frame and analyze it basically to see if it would be something that he could um, blow up into a huge, you know, fairly large painting. And if there was enough information of the, the kind that he wanted in that frame or if he could use it in a way um, to tell what he wanted to say about it. So that was pretty interesting seeing um, how he evaluated them kind of. And, you know, it, it just, I don't know, they, they um, and using the dots and all that like they do for the color and the comic books and it, it was pretty cool. I, I just, um, a lot of the things though, I was surprised how much he copied the original art from the comic book he didn't some of them he didn't change them all that much he just made them you know enlarged them and yeah. um traced over them and stuff and you know i guess he was trying to find to learn um what he could about how the original artist had had drawn them out and painted them but um and how he could adapt it to paint instead of print so that was pretty cool pretty interesting and uh, I liked he uh, said that the 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 newer com the modern comics the comics from the eighties and the nineties he didn't care for he purposely yeah. <laughs> vintage uh, bookstores looking for comic books from the uh, from the forties and the fifties and and the sixties which is the prime that was when uh, Jack Kirby was coming about and a lot a very tremendous amount of uh, artwork. Uh, I recognize it right away once I, uh, you know, uh, watch the video of Jack Kirby. I recognize a lot of Jack Kirby's art on the wall, which kind of, I maybe today, if somebody were to do that today, there would be copyright violations, whatever. But back then, it was curious how, like you said, he so on some of the images he just blew it up would trace it he would wouldn't change anything and on others he added you know different things yeah i'm not sure how that worked out as far as the copyright um stuff because it seemed like he did some of the things he didn't change at all they were just done in a different medium basically instead of in the print like the magazine the cat and the magazines he he um pa used paint so i guess I don't know. I mean, back then the copyright laws might have been slightly different than they are now. But Disney, Disney has always uh, been a uh, a uh, uh, prosecutor of copyright violations, and he's got you know Mickey Mouse and Donald yeah, you know. I was wondering that too, like if they had some kind of agreement or something, or worked out some kind of a deal between the two. They have. Yeah, they may have. Yep. Or he may have bought the particular piece from them to do it from i don't think disney would have sold and uh, sold any of theirs because they're pretty like he said like Clyde just said they're really strict about it they are ruthless but, so they had to mm -hmm. work something out there there i recall reading somewhere a few years ago there was an artist who uh, used to go around to uh, families when the mothers would would have them come in and paint disney characters uh, in their children's uh, nurseries and children mm -hmm. and disney found out about it and they actually sued that artist i mean my god and the guy wasn't making a lot of money he would only charge him like a couple hundred bucks you know and he would draw yeah. a giant mickey mouse on the wall yeah copyright rights have really gotten and very really they they're ruthless you know and even marvel marvel is very much uh it's interesting um they will sometimes um, come down heavy-handed on you, and sometimes they won't. And they're and they're 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 uh, they're. Uh, I've watched a, quite a few videos about because there's a there's a category. It's called fan art, you know, referred to as, you know, as fan art. And like I had a friend of mine, he was a Hulk friend. He was a Hulk fanatic, and he asked me to do when I decided that I was going to start this artistry. In fact, my first commission piece was from this guy 
But so twenty five dollars was the Hulk. I did a uh, watercolor of the Hulk for him, and I've never posted on a website or anything because I told him I said I don't know if this is te- technically it's, it's it's copyright violation, but uh, it's for you, private, and you know I also included a certificate that he doesn't have permission to make any copies or just do it. He said, no, that's okay. I'm going to put it on in a frame, put it on the wall. So uh, that's the extent of my fan art. I I was thinking about doing some more, you know, and then I... You know, it's a pretty sticky area to, to yeah, dabble in. I watched several different videos about it on uh, YouTube, and the conclusion is that if you're doing, you know, for like a personal thing, for a friend, but if you, if you are are uh intend on uh making several prints and selling prints like go to a uh, comic con convention which a lot of these people did and be selling prints they co- they come after you but for mm-hmm. personal use marvel is not that because they appreciate the, they want the fans you know to you know appreciate their you know, their work but um so you know i'm i'm i i'm not worried about them knocking on my door <laughs> well it's not like you pr- mass produce it or anything either so yeah but yeah. still i mean even you know the wire wrap jewelry area that i dabbled in for about 12 years um they're very get very upset when somebody copies their work or or tries to pr- produce the same thing they're producing i mean it's just you know if they take like a stealing patterns from each other you know, I'm putting their name on the pattern and that's all they change is the name of the pattern and put their name on it, you know, and you, it's obvious to see that, you know, it's the same pattern that the other person made, you know, so, yeah. Yep. That's you have all. to be really careful about copyrights when you're making jewelry also. Yeah. An artist should always uh, be, you know, be aware of that. And uh, another reason why I selected the subject of comic book artists because comic book artists, unbeknownst to me, my mother about a month ago, we were having this conversation. Comic book artists, artists affected me and influenced me. Uh, I'm an artist today because of comic book art. She told me when I was about three years old, she was in a store one time, and I saw a comic book with all its bright colors, singing on everything. At that time, I was fascinated with Disney, you know, comic books. You know, Donald Duck, because, you know, they were on, I'd seen them on TV. I was jumping up and down and raving. Even though I couldn't read, she had to buy one. Okay, so she bought one for me. And so she bought several, you know, and I, you know, and she would read them. I'd try to force her to read them to me. Because, <laughs> I, yeah, I could, but I would, she said I would spend hours just flipping the pages and looking and everything. And then when I got a little bit older, I guess when I was like five or six, he doesn't know who gave me the idea, but I took a blank piece of paper over the top and I started tracing them. And then I would color, color it in, color the, the tracing in. And I was at my grandmother's house when I did that. And it was at that point, my grandmother, this is what my mother, the story my mother's told me, because I don't remember none of this. Yeah. You know. My grandmother told her, told her, said, you know, that boy may have some talent. Because he came up on his own idea of how to trace. I didn't tell him how to do that. And he's been doing it ever since then. And now he's, he's, he's been trying to draw on freehand without tracing. So comic books had a definite influence on me. Later on, I don't know why I didn't pursue a career or studies as an illustrator. Because I, you know, I started, but I, I just, maybe I, I was, uh, Maybe it was due to the negativity because th- there was a definite con- negative connotation. I mean, in the 60s and 70s, uh, you know, and, and uh, when I was, you know, going through high school and grade school and high school and uh, you know, art classes, we didn't know. We didn't even discuss comic book illustrators. You know, they talked about. Well, I think I think by that point, the comics in general had kind of fallen out of favor. I think they were more popular in the 40s and 50s and in, into the 60s but by the time you know you were getting into high school and stuff they probably weren't that popular by then like yeah. they were back years ago 
what's interesting is they are now uh, comic book artists are are considered artists in their in their own right, and they're celebrities because you know you've got all the uh, the movies that are based on the characters that were created. You know uh, the 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 mainstay characters. You know Superman, and Batman, and the Fantastic Four, and the Avengers. These were all from the '60s and '70s, created by Jack Kirby. You know Jack Jack Kirby Jack Kirby and Stan Lee you know, uh, uh, at Marvel and, uh, you know, created all those. And now, you know, the, uh, if you, uh, create a, uh, a, a character, a new character and it gets made into a movie, it's like, you know, that's superstardom. And so it's more of a, uh, uh, comic book artists are, 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 are taken seriously now, you know, but, uh, in fact, that's why there's so many, so many young artists that are trying, you know, to, to, uh, it's like their dream job is to get hired by Marvel, you know, and they're, you know, they're duplicating and, and, and modifying the, you know, the Fantastic Four and, you know, and the Hulk and all the, and the Avengers and, you know, all the, all the various characters. And what's interesting is you would think, cause I grew up reading all those comic books. Okay. They were a mainstay as, as a boy, you know, growing up. You would think I would like the movies, but I'll be honest with you. I think the movies suck. <laughs> well, it's just like a book. Like, you know, when you're reading a book, your mind fills in what it, you know, like it, from the descriptions or whatever, your mind builds up the characters and things. And then you see it in a movie form. It doesn't match what you were envisioning. So it's not always as good <laughs> you know it's you know my my grandson is you know an adventure nut and spider-man you know he likes the movies and you know he he's got all the figurines you know that i've bought him so he's you know but um i myself uh yeah i've never never cared for the movies my favorite favorite group of characters was i love the fantastic four yeah you know, and uh, they also when they made them into cartoon form that was the best for me. That's what I enjoyed now. Besides reading. Well, that's the other thing, too, like trying to take a story or a idea from, you know, cartoons or, or characters like that that are made up and trying to make something physical out of them, you know, in a movie form you where you have to actually build things and, you know, try to put together the scenes and things that are more um, out of somebody's imagination and, you know, trying to make it a real thing doesn't always work, <laughs> you know. I love the Jack interview. The, the interview with a Stan Lee would would uh, uh, he would he would just write the very basic outline of a story, and it usually only one or two pages, and would hand it to Jack. <laughs> Years later, Jack would come back with twenty illustrations based on that two or three page story that he said would just blow his mind out. And he said he never, ever, ever had to worry about Jack not coming, not bringing to work, you know, and, and like his own son was interviewed there. And I uh, like what he said. He said, actually, he said, we had a pretty poor childhood relationship because dad was working all the time. I think he had his daughter to, you know, talk. He said they, they lived in, he called it the cave. His studio was down in the basement. No windows and just one fluorescent light. And that's, and he said he wasn't fancy like today, you know, you got artists, you know, comic book artists that have uh, scanners and they have uh, the, uh, uh, what's called the digital pads and, you know, different kinds of pens, whatever. Jack just had a pencil and regular paper. Right. That's what they said. He had a, he had the same uh, drafting table or that he had. He said I, that was always the last thing on the on the moving van and the first thing off. But And his chair, he had just an old dining room chair that he sat in. And <laughs> and uh, he just used regular pencils and regular paper. He didn't use anything fancy at all. Incredible. Uh, and if, the, if there wasn't so much snobbery, 
his illustrations were are uh, you know quality art could could you know be in a museum you know it was worthy of a museum you know and it wasn't until what was interesting was was it wasn't until Roy Lichtenstein actually started doing that that now galleries and museums are looking at in fact a Jack Kirby illustration is worth a hell of a lot of money nowadays. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, now that he's passed away, but at one, but when he was alive, it wasn't. I mean, he, you know, he, he barely ached, eked out a living. You know, he had to work all the time. You know, that the uh, there for a while that they, they were, um, they were not being selling anything because the, uh, I don't know how it got started, but they said it was, it was communism, so they quit printing it, and he had a really hard time getting back on his feet after that. Um, that incident. I don't know. Yeah, there was something about uh, uh, because he was uh, his, his of Jewish Jewish background, and there was some kind of a uh, slander that was passed around, and he was actually put on a blacklist for a little while. That's yeah. awful. He's black in the fifties, and uh, he uh, took a lot to. Uh, it, if it wasn't for the fact that he had such a tremendous amount of talent and Marvel comics just about went out of business during that period. And he, he, he brought, he, uh, he brought him back to life. I mean, his, his illustrations, you know, uh, uh, reinvigorated him. But, uh, yeah, that was, a and it was, it was a, it was somebody, you know, a competitor. He was jealous. So, you know, that's how you, that's how you hurt people in those days, you know, you know, and it's still going. He was so prolific that there was nobody else that could produce the amount of work that he was right. producing and come up with new, new characters and new stories and mm -hmm. stuff constantly. I mean, I guess it's part of being down in his basement and, you know, and just kind Having of keeping his head into the, yeah, into the creative space. It, he just was so prolific and, yeah and not be afraid of what he was creating a lot i think a lot of times nowadays i know especially i am i'm always worried about how something's going to be received if i paint it a certain way or not a certain way or you know you just worry about worry too much about you know what other people are going to think and i think he just didn't have a problem with that he just created and trusted his process to yeah. to work and it did it made his illustration so so wonderful, so dynamic and and, and action oriented. It's like uh, one of the artists who was uh, interviewed was telling that it's from an as far as anatomy goes, uh, it's not correct. Yeah, I mean, uh -uh. but the way he drew it, he you know, he said, you look at it, he got a hand reaching out, you know, and he puts a little black line here or there. And it looks like the muscle and, you know, and it, it's, it, but in reality, if you, you know, I guess if Steve Houston, who was, you know, very prominent illustrator, I guess if he, uh, looked at that, he probably wouldn't eat. Well, that's not, that's not correct, actually. <laughs> well, his drawings were more, uh, Jack's were more about the action and kind of movement of the figure and not so much um the proportion you know the correct proportions and all that he was more about trying to um have an action going like because they were saying like he he just like draw the hand that was like coming out of the screen you know at you and then fill in the behind it and, and it wasn't necessarily all there or, or all correct but he emphasized the hand so then that's what it, he wanted it to do yeah. so it was a different it was a different kind of drawing for sure like that one of the artists talking about that he says uh, he'll start out with one panel it'll be just a foot the next panel will be a hand and he said an hour later you've got this whole complete action <laughs> <laughs> oh i wish i could draw like that i really from for my pulp, <laughs> pulp radio art illustrations let me tell you i i'm uh you know well you know plot i mean if we all sat down and drew as much as he drew then eventually it does work itself Practice. out to where you have yep. a style and a <laughs> yep. style and a and a uh dedication yeah you know. yeah you just have to draw all the freaking time and i mean he sat down in his it was like a cubicle in the basement and that's all he did all day long yeah. so i mean if you do that then 
eventually, you know, your personality and style will come out and then just become more, you know. I think that's why Roy Lichtenstein was so in, enamored with uh, his work because uh, he would pick out these certain, like like Diane said, uh, certain frames of, uh, of, of images. He'd have this ideal in, in his head or he would just thumb through the comic books and then he would see a frame and he would cut it out and then put it in a folder and stick it away. And that's, that's for a future project. And then he would go and, 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 uh, like, it, like he told himself, he would, uh, when he came up with, uh, you know, uh, an idea in his mind of, of, of a, you know, a large canvas, you know, then he would go through his, his files and find these little, these little reference points. Yeah, and, and everything. It just impressed me. You know, the comic book artists, you know, uh, they're finally getting the respect they do do them. So when it's talking about the biography and, and the art history, they're they they're part of art history too. Yeah, they uh, have either of you two been influenced by comic book uh, artists? Um can't say that I have been. I mean, I used to like to read read a certain kind <laughs> but then you know that was a long long time ago but i can't say that my art was ever ever um influenced by it really yeah not me either I don't, not that i know of not that i can make i haven't made that connection i never really looked at comics all that much so i, I probably don't have that much of a connection with it but comics <laughs> It's just a boy thing. <laughs> it's, yeah, I was going to say, yeah. it's more of a guy thing. <laughs> comic books are. One of them. I mean, they even have whole stores that are just devoted to comic books now. So, And now what's so, so interesting was all of the guys who were boys, who were fanatic reading them, are now fanatic collectors. I mean, I know some guys <laughs> that just will spend thousands of dollars for a 1940s Jack Kirby, you know, comic book or whatever. They will just, you know. Yeah, they're collector's things now. I mean. You know, and that's why that that's why those stores thrive because, you know, especially some of the vintage comic book stores, you know, and they're, they're online. It's a, it's a big business now, you know. It's a, it's a, it's a big deal. Comic book artists, their, their time has come. They are just a part of uh, art history as, as, Picasso, was a Renoir, or Rembrandt, or Roy Lichtenstein. Roy Lichtenstein kind of—I think he—he kind of helped uh, give a certain stature, you know. Because right now, his—you know what—he has paintings that go for a couple million dollars or hundred. What is that one that he's most famous of? Uh, where it's the woman with the tear in her eye and the guys, you know, saying, "I, I never." Yeah, they're millions of dollars. <laughs> millions of dollars. That. Like, that's well, that's a different kind of art. I mean, the, the the comic books were basically, you know, they they printed a new one every week or something like that. So they were more of a disposable type of art, I guess, when they were when they were being made, you know, back in the forties and fifties. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's a different thing, kind of, than actual paintings that like Roy's doing or did. So it's it was taking something that was more um, of a throwaway type art and making it more permanent. I guess it's interesting. I think that's about it. We've um, hammered this enough. I hope I look <laughs> enjoy our discussion. And please, I forgot to mention the website, but please check out the Roy Listen Sign video and a Jack Kirby video. You will find them at www.talkartpodcast.com. That's talk artpodcast.com and uh, hope you enjoy them. you uh, see what we're, what we're talking about. You've been listening to the artist friends podcast episode 80 for January the 18th, 2021. And I've been here. My name is Todd J. Kale, and I've been here with Diane and Constance, my two best artist friends. I'm going to say bye-bye to Diane and Constance. Let Diane say goodbye to everybody. Bye, Clyde. Bye, Constance. Good night, everyone. Good night, Clyde. Good night, Diane. Good night, everybody. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much for listening, folks. And um, please, as always, if you enjoy these podcasts, give us some feedback. 
and give some thumbs up and star rating. However, you wherever you find our podcast, since it's on multiple platforms, thank you so much for listening. Bye bye, folks. The Artist Friends Podcast is produced and edited by Clyde J. Kale. Participating artists Diane Hunt and Constance Bronson and Clyde J. Kale. You can find more information about Diane Hunt at www.dianehuntstudio.com. Constance Bronson at www.etsy.com forward slash shop forward slash C B R O S N A N S. Clyde J. Kale at www.cjkaleartworks.com. If you would like to participate or appear as a guest on the Artist Friends podcast, please email cjkale at sign mystery otr.com. If you enjoy these podcasts, please give us a thumbs up or star rating. And most of all, send us your comments. This podcast is issued under the Creative Commons license.